and I ship over some backpacks. They're terribly made. They cost a bomb. Um, the shipping was three times as expensive as the backpacks. Some of my money gets like caught within a transaction over to Ghana, and I have to get my aunt to bail bail me out with a message saying, "You know, my money was meant to be sent to Ghana, but it's got stuck. Can you send some money over?" And this was like a couple of grand. So, you know, she was obviously quite nervous about that because it's that sounds like some sort of email about a Nigerian prince that you know you just you can you can obtain his wealth if you just send over to, like you know by now jack who you're going to hear from in a moment was on his third business jack's only 24 and he's been so motivated in creating his own business and he's still also going to university at the same time when he's developing all of this this is just a fabulous, interesting story about a young man who's looking to become an entrepreneur, has massive hurdles to overcome, whether it be a fire at his home, moving homes, traveling the world, and some of the really incredible hardships he's had to overcome, like mental health and just other things in life. You're really going to enjoy the story to see and to learn how actually you can overcome massive hurdles in life and still keep your dream alive of developing a business. Enjoy. Staying Alive UK. Share your story. Welcome to the Share Your Story podcast, Jack. How are you today? I'm great. How are you, Michael? Yeah, I'm brilliant. Thank you so much for coming on the on the podcast with me today. Oh, I'm really looking forward to hearing your story. I've I've heard bits of it, obviously, because we've met in person. We've had a cup of coffee and a chat and everything, but I, there are still missing bits for me. And what we'll we'll tell our listeners how we met originally in the fullness of of this interview um but i know your story is super fascinating and and i can't wait to hear it all <laughs> of it i can't wait to hear all of it amazing <laughs> so i'm going to start with my first question that all my listeners know i ask and that's tell us a little bit about your personal life that means where were you born yeah a bit about your education did you move around the country mm -hmm. or internationally or whatever yeah. Um, you know where you now live, or have you moved around? Just to get a, people get a sense of of where you've come from and where you're going. But then, then you know, after education, we'll transition into your first job, and then we'll move on to the business side a little bit later. But um, over to you. Okay, awesome. So, um, so you know the the old adage that life isn't always easy. Well, I think I found that that out about thirty seconds after I was born, or right. during being born. I had the uh, umbilical cords strangling me as I was as I was trying to come out, and so it was obviously causing a lot of tension for my mum. And um, you know, it was just a very stressful situation, I imagine. Mm -hmm. But uh, luckily, I popped out. And um, I think one of the things that my my parents always always say is that you know, I was I was looking around, my eyes were were so big, and just you know, I was like trying to take everything in, and it was you know, I was just, my head was going from one place to another, just trying to get as much information, I guess, as, as possible. <laughs> um, so I was born in Hackney in London, and we only stayed in that, that area of sort of East London for, for two years. And then we moved up to, to obviously where, where kind of your base now in Bewdley in Worcestershire, because that's where my dad's from. Right. And that's also where my brother was born as well. So we now live along the riverside, and this property was – kind of almost derelict when it was bought and during those times you know my dad and my my granddad were kind of doing it up and, and making it livable um so yeah in terms of schooling so we kind of grew into that house as it was developing and it developed kind of with us which was quite interesting um and yeah so I, so in terms of school I, I went to this kind of church of england school in Bewdley. um it started off as a kind of first uh first middle and kind of secondary school yeah uh, 
so I went through the first school that was absolutely well I say it was absolutely fine it was there were a lot of like trial, trials and tribulations during during our the school years so for instance we um you know I, I had kind of epilepsy during that time so so I I'd have kind of fits and I had to be on quite serious medication and I think you know that sometimes I wasn't in in the set that maybe I should have been because mm-hmm. I, it had like unintended consequences. Sure. But then, sure. Um, on terms of kind of a friend basis, we you know we developed this quite strong friendship group, and um, I had had one friend who. <laughs> so I, I went to him and said, "Oh, don't you think the headmaster's a bit fat?" And um, he immediately put his hand up in class and told told the teacher. Oh. So I, you know, I was at the age of about five I was sent sent well no five or six I was sent to the, to the uh, headmaster to say oh what have you been saying about me and, <laughs> so, yeah oh my god uh, so there's a bit, bit of an awkward one there um how old were you then yeah so I'm, I, I must have been between six or eight it, right. it, it was year two maybe or year one so it was mm. really early on in those uh, those school years um but actually my my school years were a bit strange because i had two friends and um one of them his dad passed away of kidney failure in first school and then my other friend his mum was kind of very ill during the school years and so towards the last end of school um this this same kid his mum passed so his dad passed away when when i was younger and then his mum passed away in secondary school wow. I th- and I think that had quite a deep impact on me because it was never something that we really talked about no. it was always something that was just just there and you know you, you didn't really know like, because it was never brought it up it was never something that was spoken about so I think that's all that's kind of gone into my thinkings about death and 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 things like that so so that's that, that's been been something that's quite interesting mm. uh, and because my other friend had hit his mum also had um, a serious lung condition and didn't quite make it. So it's uh, yeah, so kind of was a bit of like a, a gray gray shade or black shade kind of behind. Yes, behind maybe some of the uh, other things that were going on at school. Um, yeah, and and we weren't the most popular group at school either. We were all a bit a bit odd and um, a bit eccentric. Right. Uh, I think because of that as well, we didn't get on with the the sort of popular kids, and so we always we were kind of got the brunt end of it. I mean, I, I remember almost you know being kicked down uh, a flight of stairs in in second in the middle school. Wow! Uh, yeah, just not kind of getting on with one of the kids or something, and um, yeah, it was it was a very it was a very, a very interesting time, and it was it was very much like the in between us, like it was. It was like the earlier version of the in-betweeners, if you imagine it in kind of middle school or, or first school. So, um, <laughs> yeah, so, mm. so yeah, it was a it was a kind of a strange event. And then, kind of moving on from 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 that and and kind of all the things that went on there, I, I moved to um, a private school which only had some, from going from like a state comprehensive, which is quite huge, and having thirty people in a class. Yes, then had thirty people in a year. Because I think the issue was I, I went to this. We went to from the middle school to the secondary school, and you know I was just failing all my classes, um, and I wasn't engaged and I wasn't I wasn't really being supported in the way that I needed to kind of be because you know I maybe had some like from almost kind of from the ep- epilepsy stuff I've, I've almost had some like learning difficulties coming out of that. Yes. I mean, I couldn't really, I had to have handwriting classes and this was in year nine. So, you know, you're, you're about to approach your GCSEs and there's me having English and handwriting lessons because I can't write. And it's, yeah, it was, um, it was just a very, very interesting and, and strange and strange time. Um, yeah, I can imagine. And so, yeah, I went to this kind of this, this school he filled and, 30 people in my year and it was a completely different world because we, you know, we had the, the found, the founder of Poundland's son mm-hmm. at school. And so I've gone from seeing people, I've gone from going to parties in 
the Kidderminster council estate to going to parties in someone's house where they've got the bar and, you know, this like wonderful kind of showroom and, you know, there's Range Rovers everywhere. And oh, it, was just, it was a complete and utter contrast. It was really quite insane. So, so yeah, that's kind of, Oh, and then from there, I then, because of kind of disagreements with my parents and, and things and kind of almost like troubles at home. Um, and I, actually I had a house fire as well. The last year of my, my GCSE coursework <laughs> had a house fire in Butley and, um, yeah, it completely destroyed everything. So what the, two- the house that you'd refurbished. Mm, yeah. Yeah. So what had happened was a curtain had come over the light bulb, started smoldering because I think it was something along the lines of I'd gone to bed, turned the lights off. And then my mum and my brother come in quite late from a trip. So I ran downstairs, but I turned the lights on when I, before I ran downstairs, mm-hmm. not knowing that the light, light bulb was underneath the curtain. And so when I came back up, the whole curtain was on fire. <gasps> wow. Um, it was just almost too big to put out. And it, yeah, it dropped into my, I had a bucket of GCSE coursework that I was working on underneath this curtain which it dropped into. So all my coursework then set on fire. Oh. Uh, which was running out of the house. Um, and, um, yeah, and it was just a, it was a kind of very, very strange, ex- strange experience. We had two fire engines come. We had the guy that owned the pub down the road come in with a fire extinguisher and try and sort it out, except I had a, um, one of those exercise balls, which exploded. Oh, yeah. While it was in there. Um, Luckily, it was okay, but... What, a medicine ball? or Yes, uh, not a medicine ball, like a Swiss ball. Right, right, the yeah. spongy it's, one, yeah. Yeah, well, the big inflatable one. That's it. Um, and, yeah, <laughs> and someone had to know it from my dad, who was in the pub four doors down, and so he just comes along with his pint and just looking at this burning inferno with two fire engines outside. Whoa. Yeah, so it was, in the, it was obviously in the paper and... I had to move out. And so this was kind of back end of my GCSEs. I had to move out of my parents' house and move in with my grandmother, um, which was interesting and nice. And I think that's why I kind of got quite a deep relationship with her. Um, And yeah, so that was all very strange. And I think actually during that time as well, because I'd gone and gone from this contrast of state school to, to private school, I was kind of cut between two different types of people or, um, two different, I don't know how circles, I guess. And so yes. I actually ended up, you know, s- selling well weed and drugs to, um, to people in my, my private school. Um, and yeah, so that was, I think my gran had caught me at one point, right? like doing something with, with, with it. And, uh, yeah, so I was, it was a very, very strange time and quite turbulent as well. Mm. Uh, and what kind of age were you then? So this is back end of GCSEs, so this is 16. Okay, so you're in your teens now and yeah. everything is going haywire. Oh, yeah, yeah. You're not just so, in your own impersonal, in your own kind of world, but external world as well. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, yeah, I, mean, I think there was another situation in which we'd gone to a rowing because I was kind of briefly taking up rowing, obviously because Beaudley is quite known for that. And, um, yes. We went to a regatta and obviously in this whole rowing culture, there's still a lot of drinking involved with that. And um, we were in this sort of camping site with, um, yeah, so we were in this camping site with all this other rowing, these other rowing teams. And it was quite, it was quite nice and it was fairly safe, except that I think these local boys came around and uh, for some reason, I think I was on my own or, um, and they, uh, they basically, one of them had like a mallet and it was just kind of ridiculous. And yeah, they just sort of started on me and, uh, and yeah, it was all, uh, so I can't, well, yeah. And I wouldn't say I got beaten up, but I certainly got a black eye out of it. And, yes. um, and so that was quite, quite strange going back into this, the school the next day, obviously no one's ever really been in a fight or been hurt or 
and so trying to explain you know what happened and so I was kind of in this he field school I was quite no, I was known as almost the oddball because I'd come out of a completely different institution mm. and with some completely different values and yeah it was just uh so I was kind of yeah it was just very I had a very different perspective to, to a lot of the kids in the school which was odd so so did you feel did you feel the odd one out oh for, for sure for a lot for a long time yeah so yeah first two years of that school i kind of had a group of friends about four three or four people and they were all people that you know um was weren't they weren't state school no they weren't private school people they were still very much saw themselves as like state school or um or saw themselves as um not in that class bracket i think yeah which yeah. was quite, quite a big differentiator because it was it was a different world but for me i think i always had that inkling that i wanted to do better and i wanted to be in that that other world because if you look at my family so the house the house i'm currently staying in at the moment from to this podcast is my my aunt and uncle's house in windsor which is you know, it's a fabulous six bedroom house and amazing gardens and obviously it's in a very nice area and you've got two of my other uncles. One owns kind of a huge, huge publishing company for sports. Um, and, you know, he's got offices in Chicago and the UK. And obviously, so it's so, a so, massive global operation. And, and my other uncle, who used to own this incredible estate agent around the whole of um, you know, Worcestershire and the black country and and sold that for, for a significant amount of money. So yeah. I knew even within my family that, you know, there were, there were people doing particularly well and there were, there was affluence there and available. Yes. Uh, but it wasn't something that we had particularly as a family kind of locked in on or, or grasped. And so I've always been puzzled by the issue of, you know, why, why are some people not in that position and other people are, you know, what's the differentiator? Right. Um, and so that's, that's always been a very interesting thought, thought for me. So mm. to kind of finish up on the whole school thing. Um, yes. So after so after all that stuff had happened at sixteen, I, I moved down to Windsor, lived with my aunt, because my my mental health was sort of suffering from from being up in up in that that area. Yes. Um, and I joined this this other school, which was it was a state school, but it was almost like a private school. So it was called the Windsor Boys School. Mm -hmm. And you know, it was it was just a really nice, um, an interesting time, and I met some really great people who again had a completely different perspective, made some really great friends. Um, and it was l a lot less sort of turbulent and troublesome. And, you know, we'd, I was able to kind of host parties um, or gatherings at my aunt's house, which was really nice. And I'd go to the kind of more laid back gatherings, parties. And there wasn't really the intensity that I think was up in Worcestershire and, and maybe that sort of drinking culture as well, which was, was up there as well um yes. and so and so yeah it was just a very very interesting experience to sort of round off that whole whole school life and you know there were a couple of key events in that time which were really really amazing so i went on a rugby tour around america um met some incredible people <laughs> had <laughs> had some crazy times you know i went to a, an american frat party which was just insane um and a, a what party a frat party so you know when someone goes so america's like known for the spring break uh yes. university so although we were at school the person i was staying with just so happened to have come back from university and he'd previously been part of the school that we were now playing rugby against right but he said look i've been to windsor twice and you guys show me the best time because obviously I guess from his perspective, the drinking age was 18 in, in the UK, whereas in America it was 21. So right. he was opened up to a whole new world that he never really had had before or been seen before. Right. Uh, and so, so he kind of was on this mission. We didn't really know about this, but he was on this mission to kind of give us the best, I guess, party experience possible. Yes because he had had such a good time. So 
and he was just a really really nice guy and um he showed us around so many places in chicago um and so so that was like and but but going to america is a, is a weird is a weird one really because mm. you you've got such divided neighborhoods and we, obviously from the uk we don't really have that as much i mean it's it's probably just a too small a country to maybe have such divisions and maybe it's not in our culture but you know the particular neighborhoods in in the states that we couldn't go to and yes there were some really horrible games played i mean my other friends lived in a american military ex-military home it was kind of on the verge of ku, ku klux Klan, Whoa. Uh, and they would play this horrific game called spoons where they would like go into as it as it was called a black neighborhood um and you know they would they would find a group of people just standing around and they would um i think shout the n-word throw a spoon and if the spoon didn't hit someone then they'd have to go and pick up the spoon and they were just driving around in their sort of you know hillbilly forklift um pickup trucks and yes i just couldn't really believe that that was their their idea of fun and mm. Um, it was just, yeah, it was just a very, a very enlightening experience going to the States because it was just very bizarre, really, on a lot of levels. Mm. How long did you do that for? How long were you in the States for? So we were in, in the States. For, it was only actually two and a bit weeks. It wasn't long at all. So we went right. New York, Boston, Chicago, and then Buffalo, which is this, the town where Niagara Falls is on the u.s side right although we didn't actually see niagara falls which i thought was a bit stupid it's a shame <laughs> i mean you go all that way and you don't see the falls you know? yeah anyway it was it was still an amazing time um mm -hmm. and yeah with, with incredible people as well um and what and, and i know you said it was there was like an exchange or something that happened but so, they, so, they, so they hosted us to right. live Right. So each city will be hosted by different people. Ah, uh, right. These are all people that were previously hosted by, um, by the, our school. Right. Got Stay it. with like boys that, um. So yeah, the, the boys on the rugby team they have someone to stay with them and. Yeah, got you, got you. Yeah. And and I guess it is good because you get to see another part of the world and how oh, people yeah. live and what their world looks like and it Definitely. just opens your eyes to different possibilities as well doesn't it oh 100 percent. and i think I, that's kind of been a theme throughout my life is going to different places and understanding different people and seeing different environments as well because it's it, it has been i mean you could say it was almost confusing growing up but actually it's kind of a blessing now because you know that even though there are kind of different maybe class structures or different people in different um, social groups and different countries and different cultures, but actually overall there's a lot of underlying fundamental principles between all of these people. Yes. And so I think that's that's kind of what I learned from, from all these eclectic experiences. Brilliant. Brilliant. Okay, so – and the rugby – stuff was going on when you were still in school obviously yeah, yeah. I was still in school so so i think so, so and then towards the last round of this this school thing i kind of my mental health was really quite tr almost kind of suffering a little bit because again there was kind of more turbulent times coming in the sense that my cousin um changed gender and so for him becoming a man was a very difficult time and he was the son of the family I was staying with in Windsor so there was a lot of stuff going on there that mm. you know I, there was like underlying you know stress is this going to be okay is this going to work out sort of thing yes that I was sort of you know aware of and feeling and and so so and I, I look back now and you know I look well I look at him now and think well He's so happy he's about to get married to this wonderful girl and they've been together for four or five years um but at the time it was very turbulent and we really didn't know how it was going to unfold or what was going to happen of um, course. 
yeah. And it's it's something new, different as well. It's not yeah. something you come across. No, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, it certainly didn't didn't add stability to, to, to my life at the time. But um again, I think that's a blessing rather than a than anything else. Mm, understood, yeah. Okay. So what happened after that? What about after the education or is there a bit more education to come after that? Um, so that was sort of the end of, that was my A levels. And so I guess um in terms of anything interesting in, in A levels was that you know, I, I did my maths A level in one year, which I think was something different that, that many people kinda of had didn't do. Um and um is there anything? And I met I had this economics teacher that was utterly crazy. Um, she was amazing, and you know, I still keep in touch with her to this day. But she was the most unconventional teacher. And in what way? Well, okay, so she had very unconventional rules, and she was very, um, and she was very un- an unconventional teaching style. But she was also slightly racist as well. And in a school that was, so this is Windsor, which mm. is a white middle class area. But then you've got it's catchment area, which was Slough, which is a plethora of different cultures and um, kind of mainly um, not not um, sort of not I'm trying to so kind of India, Pakistan, um, Bangladesh, that mm-hmm. that sort of that sort of area. Yes. Um, so you can you can and so there was not only was the kind of rivalry between maybe the white middle class and the, those that sort of more cosmopolitan area, but actually yeah. in the cosmopolitan area, there was a lot of tension between the Sikhs, the Muslims and, and almost that was worse. The tension between the Sikhs and the Muslims was really quite, quite a rift that <clears throat> was probably more intense in the city of Slough than maybe we got in Windsor, but it was, we still kind of heard about kind of some of the terrible things that went on and, and Slough as well was quite, um, it was, it, was, it had a quite a lot of problems. It, the city itself had quite a lot of problems and there was always a lot of drug crime and police cars and, you know, people trafficking and, um, kind of like the, like the sex industry and, and things like that. So, so it always had this reputation as well. Um, which didn't help the people that kind of lived around Slough. Yes. Coming into the school, um, and and yeah, so, so, so that was kind of kind of interesting, like like viewing that and um, yeah. So that was that was just something that was quite interesting going going through. And anyway, mm-hmm. so so in terms of my grades and what I was doing, I, I oh so for this economics teacher, back to that. Um, yes. So, so there were a couple of instances where I think she. She said, "Oh, you." It was she set like a challenge of, you know, what's the, um, yeah, you've got a, you, there's a, your Earth's going to be destroyed or something. You've got one rocket ship. Who do you take? And then you each had to be someone. You got given like a card with, I don't know, with, um, with something like so with a note on it saying, "Oh, you're this person. You're a nuclear scientist or you're a shoemaker." Oh yeah. And you had like. A minute to pitch why you should be on this ship right and i don't know it was kind of an unfortunate maybe it was too easy to kind of kind of make fun of but <clears throat> one of the kind of asian guys was a shoemaker and he was like oh well i've really got to step this up if i'm going to get on board this kind of make-believe ship mm. so he said that he was also undercover like bomb detection or bomb operations and he like and and like had all these like and like he just knew all the stuff about military and like bombs and at the time it was it was just uh, it was i think maybe just after 9 11 or or something like that and i think the, te- the teacher actually made a comment about oh well what well, you probably have like a bomb in your shoe or something and i mean it was just oh wow yeah so so that so so she was kind of very open about how she might have how she felt uh, because she lived in Slough and so I think she there were all these like 
she might, yeah, she had issues with certain, I guess, demographics or whatever and substances. Yeah, I, and, I, and I guess she was, um, I, I'll talk a little bit, give you a chance to have a drink of water. But <laughs> I I guess I, um, from what I'm hearing there, obviously she was anti the extremism side of, you know, religion in some way. <laughs> But she was making a judgment and an assumption that this yeah. person was an extremist, you know. Oh, yeah, sure. And 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 this is what happens because there's a small percentage of populations that go in that are extreme in their views and their actions, and all of a sudden we assume that everybody that originates from that, you know, particular region of the world has those same thoughts and beliefs, which, of course, yeah. is totally untrue. No, exactly. And, um, I mean, it's it's just unfortunate that people have decided, you know, to become extreme in their thoughts and beliefs, which, yeah. of course, we also know is learned behaviour because, you know, they don't come into the planet thinking that's what they're going to be like. They've got to learn mm -hmm. that from... Uh, from know, somewhere else, yeah. From parents, from peers, from schooling, from you name it. They, they've got to learn it somehow. Oh, yeah, exactly. And, I mean, you see that – I guess you see that with um, these sort of child warriors in parts of Africa that, um, you know, were brought up from mm. such an age that the only thing they knew was violence. And, That's right. Um, yeah, it's, it, it really is horrific. But th this teacher was um, – quite an insane character as well because so not only was she kind of a bit like that and a bit outspoken but she would be trading on the currency markets while teaching us so you know she might be saying something about the, the lesson about something economic based about supply and demand and you know she'd be like, oh wait hold on a sec i've just got to make a trade and you know she'd be <laughs> she'd be buying and selling you know usd or or pounds or um, Hong Kong dollars um, throughout the day while, while teaching us. Yes. Um, and then she was also quite extreme in the sense that, you know, most economic teachers, they would do supply and demand, maybe the flower market. Well, no, she would do of the, the prostitution industry or in like, um, and there was one time when she said, oh, everything you've got is made from China. And, you know, to the boys, but I don't believe you. I think, you know, I think the UK has got a pretty good reputation. I think, you know, there's some stuff that must be made in Europe or something. Mm. And she's like, okay, well, when you go home, well, you can just take off all your clothes that are made in China and just keep on everything else that's, that's not. Anyway, <laughs> they didn't do it at home. They did it in the classroom. <laughs> and they were sat there in their boxes and a tie. And the boxes were made in China, but obviously they didn't want to take those off. No. Um, and it was literally the, the only thing that was not made in China was the tie of, of the whole school uniform. Oh, my God. Yeah. Oh. So, <laughs> <laughs> so it was it was very exciting and interesting. I mean, you, in her class, but. yeah, so she is extreme in the way that she teaches, but that particular Thing, you've never forgotten about it, right? No. <laughs> You'll never forget no. about oh, it. Exactly. Oh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I was very lucky to have kind of met her and mm. to see that kind of character as well because, you know, it's not often that, that you meet someone like that, really. No, and the thing is, you 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 learn about people's beliefs Mm. as well don't you i yeah. mean they're obviously and it also shows you there are good things about people and not so great things about people yeah and That's you good. know and it allows you to make a judgment as well mm. yeah no that's I, yeah i completely get that yeah i can see that kind of looking back on it now brilliant so she taught you lots of stuff then <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah taught me my street street smarts i guess <laughs> yeah, i guess yeah yeah <laughs> and what happened after that so so after that i did my exams and i got 
two A's and a C, and you'll never guess that the C was in economics. Right. Um, so from, I had this belief that, oh, well, if I've got an A in maths and A in chemistry, I must be science or engineering-based because economics, you know, I didn't do very well in that. I can't really – I must not have the ability to do business or something. Yeah. Well, not do business, but to study it or to go into that area. Yeah. So then I got caught onto this scheme. Cool. Because at the time I was looking for, I kind of heard about, you know, people working for KPMG, this tax firm, and, you know, they were working while going to university. And I kind of thought, oh, well, maybe there's something like that I can do. And I found this scheme that basically gave you an engineering placement a year before going to university. Right. So I signed up to it, did loads of interviews. and. I got essentially a year year long work experience at EDF Energy um, in the nuclear department or sector. Right. And I was writing reports to the government on the on on the safety of the nuclear power station and whether or not we should extend the life of the power station. Right. So. It was kind of a quite high profile job and it was Incredible. kind of yeah and it was quite very interesting i say it was interesting it was interesting to start off with because it sounded amazing but once you sort of delved into the process once you delved into the detail you realized that it was so arduous and it was so bureaucratic and you know one of, one of my jobs was to analyze the safety department and as a i mean i think i just turned 18 yes you know, as an 18 year old kid asking this department of 40 to 50 year old men that have done their job for probably that amount of time, you know, they didn't particularly like it. Um, and it made my, my job a little bit difficult and I caused a lot of tension between our department and their department. Um, uh, but I, overall, I just didn't really, I didn't enjoy the experience because one, I didn't have a great manager, you know, he didn't really particularly support, me or kind of he didn't really try and you know, give me interesting projects or kind of help me along we didn't really build a rapport i guess it's, that's probably more it we didn't really build a rapport yes in each other um and there were th small things like you'd have to hold the handrail when walking down the stairs and every time i held the handrail i'd get an electric shock oh. and, you know just I, so i was just like going into this nine to five routine and not really doing a lot of work because I wasn't really getting giving a lot of work and I wasn't really making much impact because I was bottom of the food chain and mm. it was just this kind of nine to five drudgery um and yeah it was just you scan in scan out and oh it was just so that so that wasn't particularly enjoyable my house was kind of full filled with mold and Actually, this was another instance of kind of class differentiation. So we had this girl from Charterhouse School staying, staying with us who, um, in Charterhouse School, if you don't know it, it was about 40 to 50 grand a year to, to go to. Right. Um, and she'd obviously been there for, for whole school and life. And so you've got her who likes to go sailing and, and going on all these yachts. And, and you've got the two other kind of blokes in the house who – very much kind of state school side of things and um, kind of very much more like down to earth and don't want to spend much money because, you know, they've not really had that much. They've kind of just grown up in like the sort of terrace housing that you'd find in, in like a suburban part of the UK. And sure. it, um, so there was, there was a, a massive kind of clash between between those 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 kind of two groups as it were mm -hmm. which was a bit quite a bit of tension in the house um and it was very boring in gloucester so we were living in gloucester and um if you've ever been to gloucester i think it's got one of the highest homelessness rates oh wow city and it was it was just so almost impoverished and you couldn't believe that this was really a city in England surrounded by the Cotswolds, which is so affluent and so nice. Yes. And it was just this really, yeah, really not particularly nice place to live. Um, so 
so that was yeah so that was all a very very interesting time i think one of my friends was coming back from they, they used to go to this meta, like um metal like metallica type pub yes. every night which wasn't really my, my scene but anyway one of them one of the chaps was coming back from that one night and this is 11 o'clock at night and he just sees someone walking across the road with a, with an axe just over his shoulder walking Whoa. through the middle yeah it was um it was a weird weird time it was a weird, yeah <laughs> dodgy and weird place to, to be and um yeah yeah just a very very bizarre bizarre right. time um and then sort of during this I, because i was kind of i was quite bored really yes so i set up my own personal training business right um and there was kind of a class room type thing that i could use on site at edf so i kind of marketed it with an edf and i did circuit classes every week which were had about 15 people at each time right and you know i do one-on-one sessions for people or i write kind of meal plans and workout plans you know it was actually pretty popular um you know, that, was, that was a nice bit of kind of side money coming through um yes. and they allowed you to do that then well yeah i mean they can't so i just rented out the oh you rented it right yeah um and it, it kind of worked perfectly really it was um yeah it was you know, totally fine um um, yeah, so 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 yeah, did this really cool personal training thing. I really enjoyed kind of transforming people's lives, and you know, I even did that and extended that out kind of into the town. And you know, I was training one girl who was, tw- I think she was twenty four stone, right? Uh, so she was really quite quite big, and you know, she couldn't really she couldn't do squats or anything like that because she couldn't actually support her own body weight. Yeah. Um, so that was quite an interesting challenge, and I didn't, don't think she really. She thought I was like twenty six or something. She didn't really think that I was, you know, this this eighteen year old kid. Um, yeah, personal training her, but um, yeah, so that was kind of my start, my entrepreneurial journey, really. Um, and so yeah, anyway, I was bored of EDF, and I was bored of kind of this kind of very technical aspect of the role, and it was it didn't really seem like there was much progression, or even day to day, it was just very monotonous mm. so i got us i managed to convince my manager to give me a secondment to the london office which was um trading of like commodities so yes. you know buying and selling um coal or oil or electricity and then i learned about the le- electricity markets and i got to sit on the floor with the electricity traders who are making sure that you know um edf is supplying the right amount of electricity that that, because obviously each day electricity spikes depending on who needs it and what's going on and if it's like a world cup final and everyone puts the kettle on yes huge surge and so the price goes like spikes up and everyone has to kind of help ensure that 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 gets that demand gets met yes um that was really interesting that was that was really cool to see i really enjoyed that Mm. um and then that kind of made me think, well, maybe I shouldn't be doing chemical engineering as a degree. Maybe I should really be doing something business or related. Yes. Um, and this whole trading thing and looking into investment banking looked like the solution. Um, looked kind of, you know, you can earn a fair bit of money doing that. And um, it was kind of the other side of the coin. It was instead of being in the business, you're looking at investing into the business or kind of helping businesses meet meet what they need to well to, to grow essentially sure um, and so i went to okay because at the time i i kind of had um like dyspraxia and i wasn't able to write particularly well but also because of all this kind of mental health stuff that built up but yes i was like kind of diagnosed with depression and anxiety and well, that almost worked in my favor because it it allowed me access to a lot of these like disabled groups. Um, so, so I became part of this like um, this network. So uh, I'm trying. It's my plus disability. So I'd, I'd go and speak to like recruiters from kind of FTSE 100 companies, and my first sort of intro to that 
and it was all on, on the topic of diversity and disability and encouraging more employers to hire more disabled people. Right. And so my first intro to that was this getting an investment banking networking event. And I met, you know, this, this banker from Goldman Sachs, I think his name is Ellis Jones. And, you know, he was helping Rolls Royce to buy companies over in multiple countries and cities. And, you know, each deal he was involved in was between a hundred to a billion like US dollars or pounds. And, you know, it, was, it just was this sort of insane world of yes. of chess, I think. It was it was just a game of chess, ultimately. Mm. Um, and so that sort of got me really excited about that and tried to set, almost set me on that path. And, and um, that's sort of when I went to Loughborough. So, so I kind of finished off at, oh, no, so I finished off at Gloucester. Mm. And then I went for a month's travel around Bali with my friend Harry. Um, and this was sort of the pinnacle of, of my, my sort of mental health, because I think up to this point I was actually, well, I was, I was suicidal and, um, and I was having a lot of counseling and, you know, I'd, I'd get into the shower and, you know, my, my, my daily dream would be being hit by a double deck, deck of bus. Right. And, but then that was sort of a catch 22 because I was also, because of this history of of death and I mean I was quite I actually kind of saw my granddad before he died and my other papa just after he died and I don't know and so I was also terribly scared of dying as well so being scared of death also caused a panic attack so yes so I'd kind of be depressed and be like oh what my life's worthless you know um, is there any point to it? But then I, the thought of actually dying then spikes a panic attack. Mm. So just this constant wave of depression and anxiety that just circulated. And um, and so when I when I went to Bali, it reached the pinnacle because we went to this palm reader and the palm. So you know, my my friend goes in there and it's 15 minutes later. He's like, oh, that's quite interesting. You know, I found out I'm going to get married at 26 or something. I was, like, <laughs> I was like, okay, that sounds like like pretty interesting. I'll find out, you know, what, what's going on. And um, so when I get in there, he says, well, I can either tell you about your future or I can answer a question, which do you want to know? And uh, I immediately picked the question and I said, you know, will I ever be happy? Because um, I, didn't, I didn't know happiness was like a possibility. I didn't think that it was like an actual... I didn't know it was an attainable thing. Yes. Um, I, I didn't, having never really experienced it, I didn't think that other people experienced it. Um, and so that was kind of a very deep, deep moment. And we kind of went into a lot of stuff. Um, and um, yeah, and he, you know, we kind of talked about how, you know, valuing people. And so I'd always had this thing with girls where, I would kind of be interested in one person, but then I'd see suddenly when you get to know them more, you obviously see, you know, more about them. So, you know, more flaws, but then, so then I as immediately, if I saw one flaw, I'd then compare it to another girl, but you know, maybe I hadn't been chatting to as much, but I was like, Oh, well she's like different in this way. So maybe I should just put all my energy into to her instead. So I was con continually picking up and dropping people essentially. Mm -hmm. And, not only was that probably very confusing for them, but it was also very unfulfilling and unrewarding for me because I never really got anywhere with anyone. Yes. Because constantly, I, yeah, I was co constantly comparing people all the time, which is, which is not not an ideal thing to do. Um, and he, the one, the best thing that he suggested to me to do was to actually write a journal, to buy a journal, and to, and that really did transform my life. But. But that whole kind of experience was a little bit tainted because he asked me to do a whole body scan. And, um, you know, that, that involved me kind of getting naked on a bench while he performed some weird ritual, um, which I probably wasn't the most comfortable with. Um, no. Because <laughs> this guy had nails that were, his nails were probably the same length as a 30, no, not um, a 15 centimeter ruler. Whoa. 
yeah it was um it was kind of it was a bit creepy really um so so that was a very yeah that was a very very strange experience but it was also you know opening and enlightening at the same time so it was a uh, yeah i don't really i still don't really know what to make of it to this day no i um, can imagine <laughs> yeah um, i, I did, can i send you a hesitation around it and yeah the thing yeah. is i mean all of us I'll, I'll give you a little break there jack to um but all of us have a as we go through life because we don't know what's around the corner, mm -hmm. we think that other people can give us the answers of what's around the corner, potentially. Yeah. And therefore, you know, when we're given the opportunity or presented the opportunity for somebody who allegedly can tell what's going to happen for you mm -hmm. in the future, um, then we're going to go, hey, that will be interesting to know. Yeah. Go on then, tell me what's going to happen, you know, as if you know, type of yeah. thing. And it's it's a really interesting dynamic because mm. the place where we start before we want to know, and you've heard me speak about this previously, I think. Yeah. Is that we start from a place of fear and doubt. Mm. And when we are in a place of fear and doubt, we're very vulnerable. Yeah. You know, so when you're in doubt of saying, will I ever be happy? That's that's being in mm. doubt. You yeah. Know? Um, the and of course, the kind of fear and doubt will result in something as a catch all title is called suffering. Yeah. And whether you call that depression or panic attacks or whatever, that's all classed as suffering. Mm. And that suffering prevents happiness you know and yeah. and and happiness is the absence of suffering and it's all very well for me to say it and it sounds really easy like that and we you and i both know it's not that easy to fulfill that and mm. um so okay so so you started journaling and you felt that assisted you um yeah so how did you manage to, you know, so there's lots of things going on there, isn't there? There's, you, you're yeah. like, you're like being thrown in the deep end and swim, <laughs> you know, everything's been thrown at you here. Yeah. I mean, uh, so, so another thing during that trip as well, which really kind of made me think I've, I've really got to get things sorted was that, so I was kind of opening up to my friend and I said, you know, um, kind of, yeah, I'm just in a really bad place and, you know, I'm really struggling. Um, and his response was, oh, you're not that bad. My friend, I had to stop my friend committing suicide, you know, last month. And I, and I, that it was just this sort of lack of, I think I was, what I was looking for was that kind of connection and that, that bit of empathy. But that really upset me because I was, I was like, well, you don't, you don't really know what's going on with me. You don't really understand. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But at the same time, it was, it was a blessing because, you know, it forced me to you know, stay, step up and actually make my own, you know, decide who I actually wanted to be and, you know, not rely on other people to kind of save me, which yes. is, which is important at the same time. Um, and so the journaling, okay maybe it, it could have assisted me i'm not really sure if it at that point it did i wasn't really doing it particularly well it was very on and off um and it was um so i, I got back kind of from bali and um went started university and it was just this whirlwind of you know you, you joined freshers and it's it's, you know, peer pressure drinking, it's going out every night, it's, you know, a lot of trying to um, please other people and, um, yeah, you're trying to fit in as quickly as possible and you want to fit in with as many people as possible. So, so I wasn't particularly myself 
I guess, and I wasn't really confident in myself. And this was a, a kind of big transition moment for me. Um, so I, because, I, you know, I felt, again, I kind of went back to this falling into the wrong circles, but also, just, you know, excessively drinking and, you know, that obviously plays a big part in your mental health. And um, I just wasn't very centered at all. Um, and I was, yeah, just kind of following other people around essentially rather than being my own person. Yes. Um, and so that was a very, that first year was a very turbulent time. Went back into kind of counseling and um, trying to figure a lot of things out and went, I still had significant panic attacks frequently um uh, but i but i actually started reading some really interesting books of people from what people had suggested on this trip to bali and you know eckhart tolle um new earth was one of the ones that i started reading and and reading these sort of books just gave me a complete consciousness shift right so it really deconstructed kind of the world around me which initially really fucked me up um and i kind of i had to go a bit deeper and i i knew it got worse because of that and i i tried medication for a little bit but that made things worse and you know i felt completely oh like completely out of out of it and off um but then slowly you know because because in, in in this book it's like you know a tree is not really a tree a tree is only a tree because you label a tree or he also dives into, you know, the effect that your, your parents have on you. And so when you're kind of hit with this new information, your whole, you're just trying to figure everything out, but it kind of takes you back three steps because everything, all the foundations that you initially had had been completely knocked down. Yeah, totally. Um, and so... But when once I started to kind of rebuild upon that, it was a much stronger foundation and, you know, I had a better and deeper understanding of who I really was. Um, and that really got kind of developed in my year abroad. So I, you know, I had two years at Loughborough University and then this third year I just traveled around and, and I really went on this really amazing journey so, Mark, have you ever heard of the hero's journey? Oh yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's what I use in my storytelling teaching. Wow. So that's how I feel my life's played out. Yes. You know, and, and interestingly enough, Jack, everybody's life plays out that way. Oh yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. But in different ways. I was having that discussion with somebody else the other day. Is that I I I have a tagline now that says. Um, when I introduce myself, I say, yeah. Hi, I'm Michael De Groot, Chief Storyteller at Staying Alive UK. I help yeah. people and businesses tell better stories. I know your story. Yeah. You know, because actually, although there are different facets in everybody's story, we mm. are all living our own hero's journey in some way. Oh, yeah. Totally. Totally. And it's, I've been reading kind of the book um that the that, that's obviously all been based on and you know it really is it's incredibly fascinating and it's incredibly interesting um but the, i guess the, the biggest correlation for me was that you know this hero goes away on an adventure and i went you know to four different countries around the world I had incredible challenges and like trials and it was a massive adventure and um and there's also, you know, being reborn. Well, so I was, I had food poisoning and, you know, I was stuck in bed for three weeks with no money to, to pay medical bills, but I, I had to just eat pot noodles. And I literally, the first thing I said to, to someone when I was kind of well enough to walk again was, you know, I've been reborn and I'd written during this time, I'd written my life plan and what I wanted to do and what I wanted to achieve. And I kind of went back into the world with this like huge purpose and came back to the UK with this massive purpose, which was the social mercenary. And I did loads and loads of different things that we can, I guess, go into in a bit more yeah. detail. But um, it was just seeing that 
align so well with with obviously this kind of wheel of the hero's journey it kind of gave me encouragement to where i am now which is i'm not necessarily doing what i want to be doing which is i didn't want to finish my degree um and so it's kind of given me some encouragement that you know i can i can still do the things that i want to do um which is really yeah really encouraging and really interesting and and when we've met before <laughs> it's really interesting about you in terms of your impatience in <laughs> you know you wanted to have achieved so much by the age that you are but would you like to tell the listeners actually how old you are yeah so wait um i actually always have to think about this do you uh, yeah <laughs> i'm 24 i was born in 1994 so i think that's right so yeah i think i'm 24 nearly going on 25 i think that's correct okay. um, because i don't i don't know why but i just i lost track at one point and now when any, anyone says oh how old are you then i think it's i think it's the trans like it's it's the um when you have a birthday, you don't suddenly think, oh, okay, now I'm this old, and you, you immediately now for the rest of the year know. I mean, maybe other people can do that better, but I think, oh, it's my birthday. I don't think, oh, I'm now this age. Mm. So I, it never really sinks in. So when people ask, I'm like, oh, actually, how old am I? I, I can't understand that about you, <laughs> only because y y your life experience is – beyond the years that you are actually are right now mm. so you have crammed in so much <laughs> yeah. and, i mean we probably won't have time to get everything out of it but um, yeah because you you and that's why you've got the feeling like oh, i should have achieved so much more by now but you have just mm. got such a massive lifetime ahead of you still yeah in terms of being able to achieve multiple things mm. um but it is good to be impatient, you know, definitely yeah. it's good to be impatient, but not obsessively so that it will make you potentially yeah. ill or, you know, mm. feeling so, uh, a failure of any kind because right. that's that's not true. Yeah, this guy, the guy Gary V or Gary Vaynerchuk, I don't know if you know. know yes, I know him, yeah. Yeah, so he says, you know, um, macro patience micro impatience so it's the sort of thing of you know these small things if you get them done as quick as you can possibly do them but then you've got the long-term patience of for instance his dream is to buy the new york jets um which he knows is way way off but he and he knows it's going to take a very long time but he can make this client in this particular instance super happy and he can grow this this business and make that and do this and that and he can kind of build all these different things as far as fast as he can do at that given time for those particular things and that will eventually play into the long game that he's he's looking at yeah and we we let, we won't have time to go into Gary V and his approach <laughs> yeah um and at the same time because I mean he's an american guy right and yeah. um, the Americans are very, very focused on the financial rewards, mm, definitely. Uh, which don't get me wrong. It's useful to have money because mm. it gives you choice. Um, yeah. What we also know, both of us know that having mm. money doesn't make you happy. So, yeah. but he's equating his dream of creating wealth and being able to buy something with that wealth as achieving something in life which yeah. actually that's not a great metaphor for other people to live up to um, no. in my no. view it's 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 a, it's something that could sting us later on in life yeah. in terms of well i haven't achieved the wealth i didn't achieve what i wanted to achieve so i failed yeah. whereas actually you know I think so many people fall into that. I think for him though, he's got a he's got a slightly different approach, which is that he he loves this what he's doing right now. He loves the journey, whereas yes. other people don't understand that the journey is required, or they don't appreciate the journey, and therefore they they exactly feel like like you've stated. And I think it's common for a lot of people because they don't understand that it's going to take a long time, or it's going to have challenges and and things like that. Yeah, yeah. 
No, great. So one thing you missed out because you 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 kind of jumped into Loughborough University and the two yeah. years that you'd done and everything, but you hadn't told us that what did you go and study and what how did yeah. you decide because you you'd gone into kind of engineering and and nuclear stuff yeah. at one stage then you you kind of learned more about other things so just give us a, a yeah, yeah. kind of preamble to that and how you got into that course. So I met this guy Tanashi who was so I met this guy Tanashi who was amazing. Um I think he was a civil engineer and he was also working on our team. And I also had the friend Adam who was doing chemical engineering at Loughborough. And you know, Adam was showing me the course modules and I was thinking, oh God, I don't think I'm really going to enjoy this. Um and Tanashi sat me down one day and said, Look, there's two sides to a business. There's the shareholders and the CEOs. And there's the employees. The employees get paid for what they do. They get paid on a time basis. But the investors and the shareholders, they get paid on their returns of investment and the capital flows of money and, you know, how they move resources about is kind of how they get rewarded. And it's typically, if you want to be at the top of an organization, you've got that's the route you've got you can't you're not really going to get it from being an employee and working your way up you've got to go in from this investment angle because during my time there I, I was always they always saw me like dreaming at the corner desks by the window hmm. and saying oh that's what that's where i'd like to be you know managing a big team or heading up an organization of some sort um and so he said, look, yeah, that's what you need to do. So then I went, did the secondment. I then found this investment banking networking event. And then I was like, right, well, actually, I think banking finance would be a good degree. I found that there was a degree at Loughborough. And I thought, okay, well, how good are Loughborough at this sort of thing? Okay, they're not number one. They're not like LSE or they're not like Oxford. But they're still pretty decent. They're in the top 10. Um and it's very easy to transfer, especially given that, you know, I've only got four months until I start my course or five months or something. So I transferred. It was very easy. Um, and I started doing banking, finance and management at Loughborough. Right. Brilliant. It's been an amazing course because it's not just banking. It's not just finance, but it's business and it's, you know, um, kind of psychology as well and so it's this really again eclectic mix and lots of different things that are very useful um and i mean this is i'm kind of like listening to myself say this and thinking jack what what's going on because i don't think the degree or or this degree was particularly valued for money in terms of um what you pay and what you get out of it however i do think that comparatively this degree of all business maybe degrees was was very good yes uh, and so and so yeah so so i jumped in on this and you know my first year did okay my second year did okay um did some interesting modules um and i mean the first two years i mean i wasn't really i did the work and i worked hard but I wouldn't say I enjoyed it. I didn't, um, I just sort of got through it and, you know, I had some nice friends out outside of my course and outside of my uni. And, um, yeah, yeah we actually, we lived in a, some, some crazy house, which was, you know, t um, it actually was two buildings. So one was just for parties and the other was for living. And so <laughs> being with kind of, very hockey based um like roommates or housemates there was a lot of hockey socials at this at the back of our house um and then there was one one night at this it was a kind of electronic music event and i think it was we hadn't really had a big party at the house and it's a it's a double story building you know it fits a lot of people it's on the on the top floor it's uh neon lights on the bottom floor it kind of had this like bar and snooker table and and it was like well uh, we're about to leave uni or we're about to finish this stint and like why don't we just have a party so we told a couple of people at the club 
And before you know it, we've got about 200, 300 people at this place. And it just was absolute chaos. I mean, oh, you could, God. The mm. bodies everywhere. Mm. What was quite funny about this was that uh, so I, my memory of it is kind of a bit blurred now because it was a couple of years ago, but I was, having gone back to university, I've been working at the local gym, and I was just chatting to one of the guys I was working with, and I said, oh, so you work on security, so you have to go and shut the parties down. What was the worst one that you ever had to shut down? He's like, oh, it was on Fear on Street, you know, I stopped counting at 200 people. I was like, wait, when was this? <laughs> and it was. It was my party. It was essentially this party. <laughs> the bit that he said that actually it was so super, super easy to shut down. He, he arrived, the DJ <laughs> turned off the music, ran out of the building. But the issue for them as the university was that once they, they had, <laughs> can you imagine like 300 people just exiting this house? Mm. And instead of just having the one party, you now had like seven parties of 40 people that they had to <laughs> to go and attend to instead of this, this, this one big one. But um, so that was just a very fortuitous moment that kind of come back full circle. Wow. Um, wow. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so then having been in my second year at university, there was this placement. And I know that I'd already done the nine to five work in yes. a big organization from my before university and I, and this we had to take a place when it was compulsory in the middle of our course and i thought i can't do that again i can't just go work for an organization sit there not do anything meaningful um that's really not what i'm interested in so i convinced it took a lot of convincing i convinced the head of the placement team to let me do a volunteering experience in ghana for three or four months right um on the basis that I got a CMI qualification, which was like a management qualification. Um, and then I had convinced them that I could split because that placement wasn't long enough. I then convinced them that I could find a placement in Hong Kong. And then I would do the final six months as a study abroad attachment right. in Singapore. Right. So I had this insane year. So, you know, I'm working in Ghana helping Samuel and his smoked fish business of hygienically packaged fish. And I'm having to do market research in kind of the market stalls of Ghana, which I can tell you when you see fish at 30 degrees out on the street corner, it doesn't smell too pleasant. Whoa. Yeah. So we had to write him a business plan and an investment deck and, help him do some marketing and that was a really great learning curve especially with such a different culture yeah and i was you know, i was working directly with a Ghanaian as well so um so yeah going to ghana was very strange because it was literally like going home you know everyone else it's a completely different culture and they felt completely homesick and i didn't i i just i arrived on the first day and i was like wow i thought i'd be feeling a bit weird but i actually feel completely relaxed and f completely at home here wow fantastic so, yeah and I've, I've i've retained that love kind of ever since and i'm just itching to go back now <laughs> yeah um so yeah so ghana was amazing um hong kong wasn't as planned but it was still amazing so i was trying to get still into this investment banking industry and i was trying to get internships but I didn't speak Mandarin or Cantonese, which was a big kind of, it, it, it was, it basically meant that that was getting anything like that was hard. And I ended up getting some really ridiculous internship as a, a marketing internship for a holistic health center, mm -hmm. which at the time I really wasn't, wasn't, wasn't particularly things I was into. So they were doing, you know, re, re, like Reiki and um, meditations and, acupuncture and all this holistic and crystal therapy yes. and it was you know it was a world that i kind of seen my mum be a part of and i was just you know looked kind of very uh yeah i, I just kind of not looked down upon but i was a bit like suspicious of that's probably the best word yes i'm in mean, industry i was suspicious of and I, it didn't help being at this place where i was being paid six pound a day and being you know treated really badly really because i was working she was Despite being paid six pounds a day, she was trying to make me work from eight in the morning till 
six or seven at night, Monday to Saturday. And where was this? Hong Kong, Singapore? Hong Kong. Hong Kong, yeah. Um, and so I knew it was bad when someone came for an internship and they only lasted three days. So after that, I, I quit and, you know, her response was, I, and I just said, look, if you want someone to stay longer and to do like a decent job, how about you just pay them, you know, a decent wage? <laughs> Six a day isn't really that. And her response was, you've got a terrible energy um, and you've really kind of dampened the environment in which this, this sanctuary is. Mm. Uh, and, you know, I've paid people less and they've done a better job than you. So, <laughs> um, so yeah, that wasn't really. How did that make you feel? <laughs> oh, well, yeah. Terrific. Obviously. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, so, but it, it, that was a weird blessing in disguise because after that I was saying, Oh, uh, but that, that allowed me to get my Hong Kong visa. And then I was like, Oh crap. Now I've got to really try and find something to live on. Um, and I managed to find weekend work at um, a surf shop in Hong Kong, which was like a three hour trek away, which, but it was at this, you know, exclusive beach hut, hut which I get to, got to stay at. Um, and then I got a job during the week counting seeds for this <laughs> seed distributor. Uh, it was all very bizarre, but it, you know, it worked out perfectly. And so I'd gone from being almost impoverished at the, the beginning of this to, um, to having enough money to fund a trip to Japan to go skiing with my brother, um, which was insane. <laughs> oh, it was just amazing. Um, and, and during this time as well, I'd set up the social mercenary because it started off as a travel blog. Um, and that was just during my time at Ghana really. And then when I was in Hong Kong, I was like, Oh, why don't I sell backpacks? That'd be really cool. Um, and I ship over some backpacks. They're terribly made. It cost a bomb. Um, the shipping was three times as expensive as the backpacks. Some of my money gets like, caught within a transaction over to Ghana and I have to get my aunt to bail bail me out with a message saying, you know, my money was meant to be sent to Ghana, but it's got stuck. Can you send some money over? And this was like a couple of grand. So you know, she was obviously quite nervous about that because it's, that sounds like some sort of email about a Nigerian prince that, you know, you just, you can, you can obtain his wealth if you just send over to, like, you know, yes. a bit of money. Yeah, sure, so, sure, uh, yeah. But actually, that all worked out okay. We got some bags over, and so whilst also doing these other two jobs, I was also you know on every street corner selling social mercenary pat packs in Hong uh, Kong. In Hong Kong, yeah. But you I, you got them made in Ghana. Yeah, and shipped over, which was and expensive. that was through the contacts that you had there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that you made well, after you went exactly. to volunteer. And it was, it was a, there was a lot of mistakes there, and it was very expensive to ship over. I think it cost so the backpacks might have cost a few hundred pounds to make. The shipping was a couple of grand. Um, it was ridiculous. You know, I learned a lot during that process. Mm, I bet. But um, yeah, I I was selling on street corners and I was selling in universities um, until I get kicked out of universities. And I'd pretend to be a foreign exchange student. I didn't know what the rules were, um, but I, I couldn't. I couldn't understand when when people were trying to chuck me out because they were talking to me in Cantonese, and I just didn't understand what they were saying. So that was. So they, they had to get like a student to come and translate them telling me off, which was <laughs> quite amazing. Okay, and and so the the idea for doing the backpacks. Where mm -hmm. did it come from, Jack? Why why did you decide it was Jack it was backpacks? Um, so I think I was in the UK for like a week and I brought back a few of these backpacks and my mum and my brother were like, These are amazing, you could definitely like sell these to a few people. I know a few people would buy these, these are right, beautiful. Right. So and being the entrepreneur that I am, I was like, Okay, I can make some money out of this, sure. Let's try it. And um, it became much less of a money-making thing than a kind of social project 
And uh, when I was in Hong Kong, I got picked up by um, local kind of news um, who did like videos on me. Um, I got interviewed by lots of different people and yeah, it kind of became a little thing, which was quite cool. Um, and yeah, so I, 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 t I, I kind of took the success of that and moved it into Singapore and continued it. And, you know, I had a little fan base growing up from all the exchange students and I met some local people that were really nice and really loved the idea of the social mercenary. Um, so yeah, it really, you know, just was, yeah, it was amazing. Um, and it was just this kind of cool journey that, that took me back to the UK almost with, with the social mercenary mm. coming to this, this kind of Singaporean exchange, you know, this kind of writing the life plan and, um, you know, being reborn as it were, yes. um, then developed onto this, yeah, some, something that was kind of and much did, more, oh, sorry, yeah. Go. Yeah, did you see that, okay, I've started this business, it started getting some legs. Mm-hmm. Did you think, right, this is what I'm going to be doing from now on? I don't need to go back to university or? Um, I didn't actually think, oh, I don't need university. Right. Um, right. But I was I was very much committed to the social mercenary. And I, I've, I believe that that was my future and that was my only future. Got it. Um, but when I got to university and I was, my first module was small business issues. And the woman she never started a business. She didn't know what the small business issues were. Right. And I was just like, this is ridiculous. Well, I'm, I'm not learning anything of value here that's going to help the business because that was my mindset at the time. It was what's going to help the social mercenary push forward. And the university degree doesn't help the business. I mean, it helps me get a job, but it doesn't help the business become successful or better. Uh, because you're not really learning skills that are particularly transferable into entrepreneurship. Um, I mean, you do learn some useful skills during a degree, but it's not like, it's not how to make millions, essentially, or or how to run a profitable, sustainable social enterprise. It's, yeah. it's, it has nothing to do with that. No. Fascinating. Obviously, I'm um, just a tiny little segue. Our mm -hmm. listeners will know that you're near the Heathrow flight path because oh, so yeah. often we, I can hear a, a plane going over. <laughs> it's ever so. It almost sounds like it's a, a, a sound issue on our microphones. Oh, I no. just wanted to reassure our listeners that these these are just planes flying over into yeah. Heathrow. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, sorry about that. No, yeah, it's um... no problem. No problem. I just wanted to give him the heads up that it's not our sound quality. It's just planes. Exactly. It's, it's just the Heathrow flight path. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, um, so where are we then? Where have we got to? You've, you've, you've got Sing Singapore. Yeah, you're doing the small business that wasn't helping you. Yeah. So that was Hong Kong. Then I moved to Singapore. I did an exchange. Um, and in Singapore, I was kind of studying a few modules. Um, I was traveling about a bit. So I went to countries like Myanmar, Cambodia. Wow. Uh, I went to Australia for a little bit. Um, and went back to Bali actually as well, which is really interesting because it was four years after and was it four years or three years? Um, and it was completely transformed. You know, it was so much more built up and touristy. Um, yeah, a completely different place. Mm. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, from so from this exchange, I came back. I convinced two, well, one friend and one person I didn't know that well to come and live with me in my parents' house in Budley to come work on the social mercenary. We worked together for about three months. We did this Kickstarter campaign, we raised about ten thousand um, pounds, and went to loads of trade shows and really tried to push this thing forward. Yes. Uh, 
and I was still at, and then I went back to sort of university but and I was kind of I was really not very happy there I was really not enjoying it whatsoever but um the crunch moment came when I got an opportunity to go to the biggest exhibition in Germany for sports goods or outdoors goods and they gave me a free exhibition stand whoa at this in this place is like I mean, it's probably as big as Heathrow Airport, and it was just full of big businesses. Um, and this was on the day of some of my exams, or on the week of my exams. And I just thought, this opportunity is too big to miss. Yes. So I'm just going to kind of sack in the university and pursue this. Um, and so that's what I did, and I had a, it was amazing. It was it was amazing. So I mean. The outcome of that was that the bags got put into. Um, have you heard of Regasta Outdoors? No. Okay. Um, have you heard of Crag Hoppers? No. <laughs> okay. So these are all kind of outdoor companies that have yes. stores across the UK. Yeah. So from that event, I met the director of that company and we got put in some of their stores. Um, we also got a £10,000 order from a French company, which has just been fulfilled. Um, so none of those things would have happened if I hadn't have gone to that trade show. No. Um, and so that was really quite extraordinary. Um, and yeah, so then the rest of the year was social mercenary. It was going through festival after festival, um, which was fun, but got quite tedious and intense after all, because you know, it's, it's, um, you go down there, you set everything up. It's then four or three days of from nine in the morning till 2 a.m. at night. Mm. Um, and you're just dealing with a lot of kind of drunk people who are or like on other things um, who aren't necessarily that interested in buying. And you know, it all becomes this like price competition, basically. And, you know, we started instead of selling social mercenary stuff, we were just selling sunglasses because that's what people at festivals would want to mm. buy. Mm. And it really detracted from from the business. Yes. And actually, before that, I'd been at a market stall in London, which was pretty good. But it meant that I'd go down on a Saturday morning. I'd leave my house in Worcestershire at five. I'd get down there for the market to, and set up by nine. I'd trade all day. I'd then go back to Windsor. I'd sleep sleep for a little bit, drive back down to London, do the market stall the next day, leave at six and then drive back up to Worcestershire for about 10 PM. Yes. And I did that for about three months and that again was really intense. Um, and very time consuming as well. Mm. Mm. Um, so, so it was, it kind of just became this really intense journey and I was kind of alone for a lot of it. And, um, yeah, it just became very, very, very tiresome, very difficult. And with the festivals, I really tried to push it forward. But, it, you know, we and we had a really good success at one festival making about £3,000. But then the next couple of festivals, just some were broke even, some were losses. Um, and it just, you know, by the end of it, we just were in such a bad position. Um, like the business was in a bad position. I was in a bad position. I mean, I knew it was bad when I was driving back from one festival and this was the third trip I had to make because we couldn't actually afford to hire a van. So we had to do it in a car yes. and we had all the stuff backwards and forwards on a two hour kind of drive. Um, and I was doing the final trip. I was coming back up and because I guess I was so exhausted, I lost concentration, nearly hit the inside barrier of the fast lane, swerved across did a 360 across the motorway and ended up with the car looking back down the motorway um on the lay-by in the wrong completely the wrong direction mm. and um i mean this lorry stops and helped me out and he just said wow you're very lucky um because i could have ended up in a completely different different scenario yeah yeah scary yeah, so, so that was really scary, and um, I think that just made me think, you know, I've got to start looking after myself a bit more. Mm. Uh, mm. 
And but then at the same time, you know that those sort of um, cusps with death, I guess, or being close, like those those sort of experiences, they do make you appreciate your life, and they also make you appreciate that you must have some sort of reason to be here because it could have so easily been been the other way. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so so get us up to date then. Okay. <laughs> where are you where are you with the business and yeah. where are you with your course? Mm-hmm. And how has the life plan developed after those amazing experiences mm-hmm. and and learnings that you've gone through? Yeah, so I kind of after that that literal crash, I had a very mental crash and um I just kind of fell out of love with the social mercenary um and I was just like and the business was in debt and it was just a complete and utter mess um I fell out of my suppliers and it was just all all really very intense um so I went back to university because my parents were deeply unhappy that I'd left in the first place um and I just and so actually at the time I'd moved down to London. I was staying in an abandoned warehouse in London for, in, for basically next to nothing. I was working at Uber Eats as one of their sales reps selling the platform across the UK. And I was really enjoying that. It was like one of the top producers. And I think obviously some of my social mercenary background had really helped with that. Um, and I was really loving that, but I speak. I was speaking to student finance. I was speaking to Loughborough University, and Loughborough University were adamant that I couldn't distance learn, and that I had to go back. Yeah. And after speaking with lots of different people, I thought, well, I'm never going to get this opportunity again to go back and do it because my cousin, who played professional rugby, he left it three years, and he didn't go back and finish his degree. Mm. And it's mm. not put him in a particularly bad state, but it's. It was just something that he couldn't then do. And student finance said, you know, you've, you've already had four years of funding. You can only have a maximum of five. You have to kind of do this now if you want to do it. Um, so I just bit the bullet. Um, I'd saved up a bit of money from working at Uber Eats and getting bonuses, etc. cetera. Um, and I just moved up to Loughborough, found some house that was <laughs> not, it didn't even have any students in it. No. Uh, met some they're amazing housemates but um and i was a month late from the course or maybe six weeks late i went into this course where you know people just saw me for the first time didn't really know who i was and they just thought like why is this guy just rocked up after i've been studying here for like three years um, <laughs> so anyway, i kind of get into it and i you know i don't really have anything better to do except study so so i'm studying um and it was a good reflective period. I had a module called Advanced Interpersonal Skills where we had to set ourselves a goal um, and we had to ref- self-reflect and we had to write a reflective journal every day, which was so, so important to my like healing process and like understanding what had just happened over the kind of last year. Yes. And then one of my kind of most important goals was to do this Ironman or half Ironman which was two kilometer swim, um, 90 kilometer bike ride and a 21 something kilometer run, mm. which I'd planned to do in New Zealand. And so all of it, during this time I was training twice a day to do, do that. Um, and actually having that consistency in my life was so, so important and actually building that consistency within myself to do something every day was, oh, it was, it was incredibly rewarding. Yes. Um, and so I had this kind of um, slight issue when I went to uh, went to the air, airport to to get on the flight to go to New Zealand, and <laughs> I spilled orange juice on my passport the day before. Wow! It wrecked my passport. I get and I, the photo is a bit dodgy. I'm like, oh, I've got to just try this. So I get to the counter and they're just like, "Sorry, you can't get on the plane today. We just can't accept you with this passport." Oh wow. I know, and I ring up, I ring them up, and I, the you know the insurance people, and I say, look, this has happened. Can you help me? Is there anything you can do? And they said, no, because this is a passport issue. It's your responsibility. Yeah. So I was absolutely devastated. Um, 
but I thought, you know, I can't just let this kind of beat me. So I did the Ironman by myself using kind of apps on your phone to track it. And I just did it around Loughborough, around the university. And I was, you know, I was so happy that I was able to actually complete it and do it because it was a, it was a real tough, tough one. Mm. And so, so up to speed now, I'm, I've got one more exam left, pretty much finished my degree. Um, Social Mercenary is now on a bit more of an even keel as we just completed an order for 400 backpacks and 4,000 pencil cases. Um, but I'm still not sure how to take it forward. I'm thinking about bringing on a fabric designer um, and someone else to kind of share the business with. Um, and I have want to move down to London and live in London and have some independence. Um, so I've... I'm in a final round inter- interview stage for this this job, which connects is a knowledge brokering. So it essentially means that you know if someone wants to find an expert in a particular field, I'm the plug essentially. I'm like I'm the industry plug. So I don't know. Let's say someone wants to invest in a mining company. I've got to go and find the person that knows about nickel deposits in Alaska. And find that expert and connect them together yes um and so that would be a really great experience and i think that would be a great kind of foot in the door to a lot of like different amazing people and also just it would just be i'd, I'd be based in london as well so i'm not really sure on the next steps but i just wanted to make sure that you know i've got some independence i've got some money to make sure that i'm able to to have my own life and to make my own decisions yes. um, and to, to kind of see where this entrepreneurial thing will go. Um, but hopefully by bringing people on in on the side, you know, it can, it frees up more of my time and it maybe it can help inform decision making because it's not just always circulating in my head. There's other people there to support me. Yeah. Yeah. Brilliant. Whoa, <laughs> man. <laughs> hey, that was a, a long one and i was trying to trying to chase it up towards the end but it's um i was yeah insane i know there is a lot more and and let's pause it at this stage because Mm. i think it's it's an amazing story and thank you so much for being so openly sharing everything that you've been through you know your mental health all of Mm. the personal stuff and and trials that you've had to to overcome um it is it is really useful for our listeners because h- hopefully the audience that's listening are people that are either in business yeah. unsure about whether to continue with it how do they go to the next stage yeah. uh, of growth or people that are in jobs working for big companies yeah. and are fed up have a good idea don't know how to get started and and your story is definitely inspiring and it will be inspirational for people that are listening. So thank you so much. If people want to connect with you, um, either help you out or, you know, have a conversation with you, how can they find you? If you, we'll be in the show notes. So if you could just mention the best places for them to look you up. So so the best place to look me up is uh, my Instagram account at Jack H fellows. So it's just Jack H fellows. And also, um, my email is just jackhfellows at gmail.com as well. Okay, brilliant. And um, they, can, they, they can look up the social mercenary if they want yeah, to? So yeah, and the social mercenary obviously is at the social mercenary for Instagram or anything like that. And it's the social mercenary.co.uk if you're uh, interested in looking at anything that we've got. Or you can just type in a social mercenary ASOS as well because we've got a side on ASOS that you can look at as well. Okay, brilliant. Okay, well, I'll include all those in the notes as well. So if people brilliant. can't find it, they can they can look it up. Yeah, that's and fantastic. <laughs> so great to speak with you, Jack. Oh, and you. next Amazing. time in Budley, give me a shout. We'll have a catch up and see how things are going. But success with the final interview round with that company, that sounds 
Thank amazing you. and exciting. <laughs> uh, do let me know how that works out as well. I will. And um, thank you so much for coming on the Share Your Story podcast. Take care. Bye. Thank you. Staying Alive UK. Share your story. 